All right, so uh, this is Ryan Morini uh, from the Sam Proctor Oral History Program. I'm sitting uh, here today with Dr. Elizabeth Wing, and uh, well, you can introduce your. And I would be Irv Quitmeyer. Mm -hmm. um, it's November 18th, 2016. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, so could we begin with uh, when you were born? Oh, a long time ago. <laughs> 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 I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts mm. in 1932, March 5th. And when I think about it, my early life sort of tracks academic um, institutions. In other words, I was born in Cambridge, and we lived in Princeton, hmm. then we lived in Boston, then we lived in Wellesley, and they were all places where my father uh, had a, an academic position. And uh, it was a great place to grow up. I mean, great places to grow up. It sounds it. I can, spent a couple mm. of years in Vienna, and that was, mm. yeah. But how old were you then? I think around five or five, you know, plus or minus. Mm. Old enough to learn to speak German, and uh, it, was, it was good. Sounds it. Did. At that age, mm. I didn't realize, you know, that this was something special. Mm -hmm. Because we lived right next to Schönbrunn. Do you know what that is? No. It's a castle. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's not your ordinary house. And, and uh, there were grounds around. And hmm. um, yeah, it was very nice. Sounds it. it. Did your family speak German? Oh, you bet. Okay. Uh, my mother was Viennese, so she mm -hmm. only learned English later in life. And um, my father, uh, my father's parents were originally from, grandparents were originally from Germany, but they, German was part of their culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all spoke German. Um, okay. my, gra my American grandmother uh, was horrified. Here this child only speaks German. How is she going to manage in school? <laughs> but I managed. <laughs> <laughs> so it would appear. <laughs> well, at that early age, language acquisition is just remarkably uh, uh, stepping way ahead, but mm. um, my, my, daughter, my daughter went with my Viennese mother to Vienna for a year. Uh, my father had died, and it seemed like a nice thing for, for companionship with my mother. Mm. And so uh, Molly, my daughter, went to the same school that my grand that my, her grandmother, my mother, had gone to. And uh, we, to make it seem not so scary to her, we said that uh, Stephen and I would come over to Vienna in the fall to visit with her so it wouldn't be su such a long time. Mm. And when we came, she was talking a blue streak in German on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there it was. <laughs> but she went to a, a um, convent school that my mother had gone to mm. and uh, worked out well. Yeah. She was the little darling of the family. <laughs> um. I mean, some people believe that uh, growing up bilingual kind of helps you. Um, I know this is a vague phrase, but sort of expands the mind to see from different angles. Would, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, there's been a lot of discussion on the radio about hmm. um, bilingual 
whether it's uh, helpful or not. Mm -hmm. And I think the more you know, the better it is. And it's wonderful to be able to converse with different people in their language. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I um, I don't know what the downside is. Uh, all those Romance languages have the same mm. origin, and so words are not that drastically different. Now, if, if it was Chinese and German, that might add a mm. <laughs> great expanse <laughs> to the mind. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that does make sense. Um, it, it, can I ask your parents' names? Yeah. It, my father's name was Henry... Schwartz, S C H W A R Z. Okay. And my mother's, you want her maiden name? Uh, yes, please. Uh, it was um, Maria Lisa, was her first name, and Gutherz was her maiden name. Gutherz, so that's. G U T H E R Z. Okay. <laughs> Means good heart. It's a beautiful name. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I ask how they met? Uh, yeah. Um, my mother uh, was Viennese mm -hmm. and um, was interested in the English speaking union. It was an organization in Vienna. Mm. And a friend of my father's had been in Vienna and met my mother. And then when he came back, and my father was about to go to Europe, um, he said, uh, the friend said, oh, I met a very, very nice young woman in Vienna. Why don't you look out for her? That was my mother. <laughs> so he did indeed look out for her. <laughs> so... Uh, in my early years, we lived in Vienna for a while. Mm. And uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not exactly sure how that articulated with the uh, World War, mm. uh, but it must have in, in a way that I didn't know at that time. Um, then we all, all came back. Well, actually, I believe, in fact, I know my parents came back because they wanted me to be born in America. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, then they, they stayed, though, off and on. They would go back. I see. Um, <clears throat> and the... It, well, I'll, I'll come back to your parents in a minute, but um, it, your grandparents, could you, who were they? Okay. <clears throat> I, uh, I don't know too much about my mother's parents. Mm -hmm. um, her, uh, it, it was just a very peculiar family. Mm -hmm. um, her father went to China and I have no idea why, hmm. but um, there must have been something of interest there. And then, um, um, I really don't know. I, this sounds callous and it's not intended to be, but somewhere along the way he died. I, I, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know the details of that. My sister would probably know more mm. um, because she was, is very involved in family and family relations. But as I say, I just don't know um, exactly how that all went. But I do know that my mother's brother was in concentration camp, but it was American concentration camp mm. um, just at the start of the war. 
because I think he had been in the Austrian army. But I, I, I just, I don't have details on that. I'm not very confident in that. Understood. At any rate, uh, what more about? I don't know much more about those grandparents. My okay. father's parents uh, lived in uh, Connecticut, mm. and uh, they had been in this country for, they had been born in this country, though their parents were born in Germany, I believe. Mm. Um, and, but my father was reared in Connecticut. Mm. And I knew that grandmother quite well. Okay. My father's mother. What was her name? Uh, Irma Hammer Schwartz. I, her real name was Irmgard, but she was called Irma, I-R-M-A. And Hammer was her maiden name, H-E-M-M-E-R. Okay. And then, of course, she was Schwartz. And it's S-C-H-W-A-R-Z, no, no T in there. And, uh, and they, so your, your father's grandfather was F-A-O Schwartz, if I'm, yes, if I understand that's that correct. correctly. Yeah. Do you know much about him or did you hear much about him growing up? Um, not, not really. Of course, the store, the store uh, was, uh, quite an attraction. <laughs> <laughs> I can um, but no, I don't really know much about about the details. Mm -hmm. um, my father was one of three children. His older brother was also FAO. Mm -hmm. And he went on to be a, a lawyer, a very prominent New York lawyer, and also managed in a way, managed the store, not hands-on, but oversaw it. The store, of course, being a hair sports mm. toy store. Uh, and then the second in line was my father, who had, though I think he worked at the store one summer, had no interest in business. And he became a history professor at Wellesley College, that's what he really liked. Mm -hmm. And then the third was um, my aunt. Her, she was also Elizabeth, though they called her Betty. Betty. And uh, I guess the dominant feature of her, or a dominant feature, regrettably, of her life was that uh, I had heard, I, I never really knew, but I'd heard that she was quite spirited, mm -hmm. and she was riding a horse along the Merritt Parkway, and a horse stepped in a hole and fell on her mm -hmm. and broke her back, so she was paralyzed for her adult life. But um, she managed very well mm -hmm. despite that, because she was quite vivacious. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so that's those, yeah, is that? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing from what I understand, your father really encouraged you, your father believed that um, you should go on to get a PhD. He believed that uh, women should be free to become professionals at a uh, time when that wasn't necessarily yeah, a widespread Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was more just, you know, <laughs> so on, on, on. Yeah. No, it was it was good, and he believed very much in women's education. He ended up teaching at Wellesley College, which is a women's college, and uh, very, very um, concerned that women not follow their interest and get themselves educated. 
Would you like to sit on something there? I'm okay. You're okay? I'm okay. Because <laughs> we could put a stool there. All right. Yeah. Can you put your drink yep. there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got it. Got it. Oh, that's nice. I can put it back here. That might oh, be yeah, better. Oh, you can reach around. Mm -hmm. let's, let's move this over to that. Let's move the other side. Okay. It's starting to get a little interference. It might be just because it's so close by. Is that better? I mean, I'm not getting it now. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's fine. It sounds beautiful, though. Okay. It's gorgeous. Okay. Okay. No interference? No. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, so how did he encourage you to, in terms of, I mean, it sounds like even as a child, you were sort of expected to go on to a PhD. Well, expected to, to pull my weight and work. Okay. I mean, not work, um, uh, study work, mm -hmm. not, not, uh, well, I, I wash dishes, sure. You know that uh, house, household things, gardening things, but um, yeah, and I was very fortunate to go to really good schools, mm -hmm. very fortunate. So uh, that yeah, the expectation was to to study hard and contribute. And, and did you? Was there any resistance to that in the schools you went to, or were you was that attitude supported there? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do any of your teachers kind of stand out from that period, or? I haven't kept in touch with many of them. They would mm. be really old folks yeah. by now. I suppose so. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, I had, while I still lived in the Boston area, I had mm. kept up with the teachers. The biology teacher, Miss Hamilton, was a very, very pleasant person. And, uh, yeah. And I, it, I did read that you, um, one of your earliest memories is something about a, uh, a bucket full of earthworms. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, that was when we were living in Vienna, mm. and the gardener was spading up the soil, and here were all these lovely creatures uh, writhing around. So uh, I gathered them up in my little pail, you know, <laughs> brought them in, and... Uh, they were not appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> my father would have appreciated them. Mm. Yeah, but my, no. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do a lot of uh, things outdoors growing up, exploring? As, or? Yeah, as much. Uh, exploration was limited, in, mm. you know, by fences mm. and urban living. And uh, we didn't, uh, we took walks in the park. Mm -hmm. It was different from the way I raised, or we raised our son, who lived over here near Bivens' arm. Mm -hmm. And okay. there was, in the little old ramshackled house we lived in, had access to uh, quite, a, I think, about 20 acres of, of woods and marsh, and, and there was the lake itself. And uh, looking back on it, I thought, I think, wow, I was kind of hands off and, and not worried about him. But I wasn't worried because he seemed to observe and you know, he, was, he wasn't foolish mm -hmm. when he went out into the woods. And uh, so, anyway, he survived. <laughs> survived well. <laughs> so, 
marine ecologist. Hmm. Now I should worry where he dives into the deeps, but uh -huh. can't worry up for everything. As long as they, they're sensible, yeah, and and know what, know what their abilities are, and so on. It's, no, that's true. Um, so, it, I think it's while you're in high school that you started volunteering at the Harvard Museum of Comparative yeah, Zoology. Yeah, right. How did that begin? Oh uh, well. If you know somebody. Hmm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, my parents were good friends with the Chevilles, hmm. and Bill Cheville was a um, um, I don't know exactly how what his title was, but he he went on submarines and he was a marine biology type person and his wife Barbara Lawrence uh, was a mammalogist mm -hmm. and so I volunteered for her in the mammal department I see and then uh, there were times when other people at the MCZ could use a volunteer and I was helped them, helped, uh, well, I worked on the beetle collection mm. uh, very briefly and uh, I sort of got passed around a little bit. Uh, well, so you got to kind of see different parts of that museum. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's... it was wonderful. Mm. It was wonderful. Yeah, I really loved that. Do you remember a favorite part of it? The whole thing was oh. great. No, it was enough, it was yeah. fascinating. You could pull it. out drawers of, you know, yeah. specimens and so on. It's uh, well, and I mean, today you can go on Google Images and find pictures of all those beetles. But I guess at that time, it was the real beetles. Yeah. Well, they were dead, but mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was wonderful. Fascinating. Um, well, and so, uh, what do you remember about Barbara Lawrence? Uh, very kind, pleasant, Bostonian to the core. <laughs> uh, maybe that doesn't mean anything to people, but there's a particular culture hmm. that she reflected, and oh, uh, she was from a good Bostonian family, mm -hmm. uh, lived in Concord, Mass, and uh, she was very much um, no fuss, you know, mm -hmm. just go do, lie, enjoy, you know, uh, uh, help with this. and. Um, very, uh, she just epitomizes good New England stock, mm. if you know what I mean. Mm. She, uh, very much of an individual, not, mm. not interested in show, but interested in getting down to the core of things. Do you think she had an influence on you at that time? Oh, clearly, yeah. yeah. Clearly, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I mean, do you think it helped at all to see women succeeding in science at that time? Because again, it's societally yeah. that wasn't really a message you would get. Uh, except that um, my father, mm -hmm. you know, just no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in my family, I was the oldest, and then my sister, and then 
finally a boy came along. Mm. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> but we, I don't think mm. we were sort of put in the position of trying to fulfill a boy's role, mm. but, uh, but I think they didn't want to make a real distinction between what they anticipated a boy would do or a girl would do. Mm. I don't know. No lowering of standards or anything. No was, way. Mm. And, and also, uh, you know, I didn't have to stay in the kitchen, you know, mm. that kind of thing. Oh. Understood. Yeah. Um, did, it was, uh, so you were born more or less during the Depression era. Yeah, very much so. How did I, that impact your life growing up? We don't up? waste stuff. Mm. And I remember needing a piece of paper, and so they passed me a piece of the, the newspaper, and I could write around the edge, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Oh, yeah, no wasting. But that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. And oh, same with food or with anything. Uh, yeah. Don't be extravagant with it when you have it. And don't waste it. That's, uh, I mean, this is jumping ahead a bit, but that seems to be a, a disposition that you kind of carried with you as you were f working on the collections in the yeah. museum and developing other things. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's something, you know, that's instilled at birth, sort of. <laughs> and uh, my mother lived through an even harsher depression in in uh, uh, Austria, mm. so uh, she was also very concerned with, with uh, um, not being extravagant, not wasting uh, resources. Um, no. Yeah, it's good. Oh, it sounds it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Let's see. The, <clears throat> and I understand you were involved with creating the uh, Barbara Lawrence Prize for the Society of Ethnobiology. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I just nominated her because I knew, I'd, since I'd worked with her, had known her outside of work. And um, she never did get a PhD, which in those early years was not an essential mm -hmm. requisite, but it surely would have helped. Yeah. But as things worked out for her, she, uh, she didn't, in fact, get a PhD, nor did her husband. Hmm. But he, uh, he managed really well because he was so bright and, um, and people wanted him around hmm. and uh, I don't know how it would have been different if she had gotten a PhD at the MCZ there was an a woman who worked on spiders she did have her PhD but she didn't uh, it didn't make a big difference in how resources were distributed at the museum level, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not sure it would have made any difference mm -hmm. with uh, Barbara, but she, I don't think she ever got the recognition that she should have mm -hmm. from my perspective, you know. Yeah, well, you, you got a chance to at least try to help address that too. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. Um, so, you, you went to Mount Holyoke, is that correct? Um, and I gather you were uh, waiting tables and feeding salamanders. Is that? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did I tell somebody that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe so. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, keeping that the salamanders going mm. was. Good fun. Um, 
and so I'd have to go to the inn to get a hamburger and get real good good hamburger for them if there wasn't anything available. It was pretty <laughs> funny. Uh, yeah, um, as I told you, my father taught at Wellesley, and I knew Wellesley quite well, and I would have liked to have gone to Wellesley. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, just because I knew it. Uh, but uh, my father said you should get away from home. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a point to that. Um, Mount Holyoke was more uh, in a rural setting. It was, in subsequent years, it's gotten connected with MIT in that mm. students can take courses either place okay. and get credit at Mount Holyoke and some other um, university, maybe BU, I, I don't know for sure, but it's, um, it's not quite as isolated as it was when I was there. Mm. I don't mean isolated in a bad way, but just... Um, Yeah, it was, anyway. More of a, an institution unto yeah. itself, I guess. Yeah. yeah, it was more, and it was way out in the sticks, you know. It's beautiful mm. countryside, but but it wasn't sort of an easy, easy bus ride to mm. MIT or anything like that. Understood. That where else they would have been. Mm -hmm. Kind of a smaller community, I guess, in that yeah, sense. Yeah, very much so. One. Yeah. And so you studied biology there. You bet. Right? Um, and my understanding is, you were sort of pushed away from the direction you ended up going in because the the recommendation was to go toward medicine or toward other. That was the that was the um, prevailing belief that that uh, one should um, do something useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, and medicine was in, uh, like, you know, uh, sort of what one would think of right away. Yeah. It wasn't my parents at all that made, made that. Um, uh, suggested that, but at the time I graduated from college uh, and got ready f to go to graduate school, um, that was that was a time similar to what has, uh, you know, jobs were mm -hmm. l less available and so mm -hmm. on and. In a way, it was similar to what we've gone through recently. Um, I've lost the train of thought. Yeah, the uh, natural sciences is even today. I don't think uh, provides a great source of of employment. Mm -hmm. Probably not what medicine or would at any rate um, that's okay mm -hmm. worked out <laughs> <laughs> I guess so well the, to kind of not entirely backtrack but where does the interest in biology start like because you mentioned With the, the worms the worms the worms <laughs> is like the spot but no even before that you know anything that crept or crawled I would, mm. and my father promoted that. I mean, he mm -hmm. would bring in stuff to look at, and I can't think of a specific example, but yeah, he he'd open my eyes to wonderful th biological things, mm. and we tried to do that with our children, and Steve certainly took hold of that. He's a marine biologist. Um, Molly was less interested in 
that, though she loves gardening and plants. So it's, she's not entirely separate from, from those interests. Well, and it, I also read, and this is skipping ahead, but um, your son got you, I think, an anhinga and a couple of other birds one year for Christmas. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> were those, I mean, I guess he hadn't processed them. Were they, it was no, just. No, they were the, dried. Huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah. he had grown up with, with a mom who dealt with those things. Mm-hmm. So to have found an anhinga, no matter what state it was in, Mm -hmm. uh, that was sure to be a good prez. (laughs) (laughs) Better received than the earthworms, I guess, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, so you, uh, when you went to grad school, you chose between University of Chicago and University of Florida. Well, I went to the um, the ecologist who taught at um, at Mount Holyoke and asked her to advise me where the best natural history program was, and those were the two places mm. she recommended. And I'm really not a city person, so um, so there was only one choice. <laughs> Uh, and I sense. don't regret it for a moment. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was really, really good. Did it take any adjustment moving to the southeast? Not a bit. <laughs> Leave those coats and things behind. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. No, no, it was it was great. Um, yeah, it was really good in every way. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, I may have told you this before. Mm. I don't remember now what I talked Mm. about, but uh, my mother did come down to visit here in Gainesville, and I lived in uh, that student enclave that's just north of Flint Hall. Mm -hmm. The little houses Mm-hmm. Pretty run down at that time, anyway. And I lived in a very run down house uh, with another woman who lived, we shared the, the house, and there was a hole in the wall where the neighbor's cat would come through. And, you know, it was that kind of a shabby mm-hmm. existence. And my mother just, <laughs> she was the Viennese, you know. Mm. just burst into tears that her daughter would be living under those conditions. But it didn't worry me. It didn't mm-hmm. worry me at all. I mean, I, it's not the way I had grown up. I'd always lived in very posh conditions. Um, so it was just that I didn't didn't need to have Mm -hmm. You were focused on what you were there for. Well, yeah, 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 and it was cheap, so. (laughs) A lot to be said for that. (laughs) That's, um, although, so what was it like being at, I mean, UF had only become co-ed a few years prior. That's correct. That's correct. Um, The major professor I had was uh, James Lane, mm. and uh, I don't, I didn't feel that he treated me differently than the fellows that worked for him mm-hmm. or worked under his direction. I mean, he gave me uh, information about possibilities or for employment or for studies or whatever, and. Hmm. oversaw my work and made constructive just suggestions and it was altogether really pleasant hmm. yeah yeah it was good 
I mean, what was UF like at that time in contrast to today? <laughs> Small. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really... Uh, today I can't even find my way around campus. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know Flint Hall? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Flint Hall was about it. And then there was the chemistry building, which was pretty big. And then there were a whole number of flavets, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, f uh, temporary buildings mm -hmm. from, um, where was that place? The, oh, uh, Fort. Um, they Camp, were. Camp Landing. Or Camp Landing. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I wanted. Yeah, that would yes. probably be it. Uh, and they were set up sort of, and they had uh, laboratories and offices and so on. So it was very much um, temporary, but, mm -hmm. but it worked perfectly well. The mammal collection was in one of those temporary buildings. Didn't leap, uh, or if it leaked, we got it fixed. And, you know, it <laughs> was... Uh, no, it worked out well, but it gave much more open feeling in front or when you looked from campus to Flint Hall, there were those giant pine trees, but grass underneath, a big meadow underneath it, and then the big chemistry building, and then those flavets there. It was really quite nice, and then... Mm -hmm. It wasn't a big deal to get into countryside. And that's uh, and did you take a lot of trips to get out into the countryside? Or? Uh, I wouldn't say a lot. Okay. What I worked on was was um, um, pocket gophers, and they lived hmm. along the roads hmm. and so I didn't have to go anywhere special hmm. for them and uh, it, do, you, do you remember any stories about collecting the pocket gophers or working on your thesis? Or? Well everybody wondered what in the world are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> And I could go into a long song and dance about it, but uh, no, it it didn't seem, as I remember it, mm -hmm. and this may be that I didn't have my eyes wide open, but I didn't feel as though I was being treated in any way differently, and mm -hmm. what I was doing was what was expected, and... Uh, so you're working, digging up pocket gophers. Well, that's good. You know, <laughs> it was uh, it was a nice group of people, students in the biology yeah. department, doing great variety of things. Uh, were there other women graduate students when you were there, in the department? Um, there was a woman, Betty Starner, who mm. worked for a while. Um, I don't remember. I don't really remember oh. anyone else. Okay. I mean, I remember other people, but mm -hmm. I don't remember. There was a, a botany, a botanist whose name I've forgotten, Diane T. Strake. Mm -hmm. She um, worked in, in botany. I've even forgotten what aspect of botany she worked in. Mm -hmm. Well, and so who were your mentors at UF? Uh, at, at here at the yes. university? Yeah. James Lane. Mm -hmm. who was my major professor. Um, um, I forget hmm. names. Uh, Pierce Broadcorp. Okay. 
Uh, he was a botany, uh, excuse me, birds. Is that right? Yeah. He worked on birds. Am I confused? No, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. Liz, he was also at the uh, at the museum. As yes, well. yeah, yes. Or ornithologist, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where I remember him <coughs> was in Flint Hall. The mammal department was here, and then his his office was right next to it, and the laboratory was here. I'm trying to visualize it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he was probably the work. I, I didn't work with him, but mm -hmm. he was um, there to ask, to do, you know, ask questions about. So. Okay. So how did you start to get involved with anthropology? Uh, I uh, early on, um, one of my jobs was to work with Howard Chamberlain, is that right? Yeah. He was sorting um, pot shirts and so on. And it was in the Siegel Building. I don't know if you visualize the Siegel Building, really mm -hmm. tall. But then if you go to the back of the Siegel Building, there's a um, a driveway that goes down into the basement of the Siegel Building. Mm -hmm. and if it rained, it sluiced water down in there. And that was the fl basement floor that uh, I was working in. And Offenberg had his tortoises down there and forget what else was down there, but the pot, it was a big storage area too. And Howard was working on uh, sorting potsherds mm. and I think I was supposed to help him or do something and um, there were bags of bones that weren't that they had taken the potsherds out of and they just left the bags of bones up there and so obviously some Somebody needed to work on those things. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. yeah otherwise, they would have been just, you know. Yeah, well, and so how did you, because there was no zooarchaeology at that time, how did you approach Well, that I just study? identified the, uh, sorted and identified the bones as best I could. There was, in Flint Hall, there was the vestiges of comparative material, and Pierce Broadcorp actually had a wonderful comparative bird collection. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something, you know, totally new mm -hmm. that had needed to be done. It was, it was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um, I can't remember whether there was some pushback on working with the bones that, that Chamberlain had sort of put in the, not overtly in the trash pile, but, mm. you know, they weren't what he was interested in. That's mm. basically it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, was there a lot of interest in the work that you were doing on those bones, or...? Mm. Kept me out, out from underfoot, you know? uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But there was the example of Pierce Broadcourt's working on the bird remains, uh, mostly from paleontological sites, but um, 
I guess, entirely on uh, from fossil sites. Yeah. But it wasn't a, a big departure from that. Mm. It, and his collections, did he create those himself? Or, yeah. So that was his own collection? It was a... Or, he collected or, it for the museum. Well, okay. I think. Yeah. Okay. But he had done most of that work. It wasn't oh, yeah, pre-existed. Okay. So. That was my impression, anyway. Yeah, and those have, have ended up as part of the collections. Yeah. At the Florida Museum. Yeah. Oh, okay. So still, still part of that legacy. Huh. Um. Okay. So. So how does the um, the connection to anthropology proceed from there? Because I, I guess that could have just been a side exercise and then back to pocket gophers or something else, but well, you continued he, down that track. Yeah, here again, Barbara Lawrence had worked on the animal remains, but mm -hmm. from Near Eastern sites. Mm -hmm. So that was a clear model to follow. Yeah. Okay, um, and uh, you, when when did you meet your husband in all oh, this? I told you about the kind of rundown house that I lived in while I was mm -hmm. studying. Well, he lived in a spissy, spiffy <laughs> apartment. <laughs> well, I mean, moderately. Oh, there weren't cats climbing through the, <laughs> the ductwork. Um, he uh, he shared an apartment with Larry Ogren, mm. who was a biology uh, student, and so I knew Larry from working in the biology uh, department, and then I was introduced to Jim, and it was. Uh, I'm trying to think the distance from my uh, apartment to his would be maybe the intersection up just right up here. Okay. Where that car is now. Mm. It, it was very, very close. Mm -hmm. And so we got to know each other and, and one thing led to another. All right. So I guess we'll start up right. again. Um, so I think we're at a good point now to kind of talk about your career and how that developed. Um, so kind of coming out of grad school and as you sort of, uh, yeah, so, it, well, uh, although prior to that, I'm sorry, um, you, you did some early underwater archaeology as a grad student, is that correct? <laughs> uh, um, and so I... I read that your initial training dive, you went 75 feet into Ginny Springs. Can you tell us about that? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the professors that I worked uh, with or who taught me um, was uh, John Goggin. Mm -hmm. You know him? I know the name. Yeah. yeah. He, was, uh, he was an individual. Uh, who uh, had lots of really good ideas and and was very enthusiastic about what he was doing. Hmm. And uh, he was the one that started, or at least so far as I know, he was the one who started the underwater archaeology, underwater hmm. exploration of sites and so on. Because often you can see a site and it's spilled or washed into a river or stream, and um, and John, I think, was uh, also looking at sites that originated when the water level was lower and and um, was on dry land and now submerged. So he he liked to do uh, scuba diving and underwater diving and of course it was all brand new to me um, I mean swimming I can I've always done but um, doing the underwater uh, part of it 
and looking for patterns of, of debris that might be archaeological sites. And uh, so we swam up on the Swanee River, I think. Um, kind of forgotten exactly what what streams and rivers we mm -hmm. uh, swam in. Um, but I think the Swanee River comes out in the Gulf, I think. And um, mm, oh, well, we did various and sundry exploration dives um, with scuba tanks or just with, uh, you know, a snorkel. Mm -hmm. depending on the level of the water. But I haven't really followed this mm -hmm. uh, a lot, but I was led to believe that that was some of the first um, underwater archaeology. And, and as I say, I, I don't know that that's true or, mm -hmm. or if it's true down here. You know it. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but we had a great time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was great fun. Um, collecting things systematically was a bit of a challenge because of the, the current uh, mm. that might have moved, moved artifacts. But uh, we did the best we could to sample in smaller areas. Mm. How did you do that? I mean, I guess you can't really set up a grid under the. Well, he in did a current, have you, he did have sort of an apparatus that okay. could lay it down, as I recall. Mm. Yeah. So there was a one thing that I appreciated with with him a lot was um, the uh, attention to detail or attention to uh, keeping keeping samples discreet and and not sort of letting things come in and change the, com the complexity of the sample. <clears throat> um, sometimes I hear nowadays that um, is different from what uh, Goggin advocated was, you know, keeping things very discreet and <clears throat> so that you had, could, if there was a pattern to the debris, you could you could see it. Did that, I mean, I guess you didn't do a whole lot of underwater archaeology after that. Um, well, I did or a, you did some? You did a fair amount. Okay. Well, I mean, fair amount. You went out regularly for, for a while. Okay. Later in your career, you mean? No, no, at that time. Okay. Yeah, no, I didn't carry it on. No, you're right. Well, that's, I mean, I guess what I'm wondering is, do you, do you think those experiences had any influence on how you approached archaeology later? Was there anything you learned in that? that... Oh, definitely the, the being precise, mm. being precise and um, setting out a grid and maintaining that mm. um, very much so. So now when I hear people just gathering stuff, I, John wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I think it was the proper thing to do mm. because how do you analyze it if it's all mixed up, so to speak, even though through the ages the water may have d dispersed some, some of the material. Anyway. Yeah. Well, the I mean, 
there's always something that can disperse material yeah, for better yeah. or worse. That's but it seemed that if you get a good sample, you might be able to um, verify that it had been, you know, if it, it had been moved or had, um, that the source was uh, further up or further into the uh, current. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, and that's not explaining it well, but yeah. I, th I think that makes sense. The, um, to, so what would you, your dissertation was on the mammalian faunas in Trinidad. Is there anything, are there any stories you remember in connection to that, or is there anything you would want to say about the, the dissertation itself? Basically, I'd always heard about Trinidad, of course I knew where it was on the map, mm. and I was eager to go there just to see this, uh, this area, and the interesting thing would be the connection with the mainland of South America, mm -hmm. and then the, the cultures of the Caribbean, and the um, impact of being at the edge of the uh, gulf there. So it seemed like it was also, it would have access to cultural material from the mainland of South America, as well as changes with uh, people moving along the coast. Mm. Okay, and um, let's see. Well, what was your experience with writing the dissertation? I mean... Hard work. <laughs> 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 Mm. <laughs> yeah, because it was really the first long mm. um, uh, how should I describe it? A long involved sort of presentation that needed to be backed up and explained mm. that was uh, uh, previously, everything I had written before was sort of manageable. It was mm -hmm. discreet, and this was a much bigger and more complex um, exercise. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, I know advisors today sometimes try to get students to cut down their dissertations because there's. Not too verbose. Yeah, but um, I guess at that time that was not as much the case, was it? Well, um, worked from an outline always, and the question was how much, where do you make the, What is the, the sort of the size of the unit that you're going to be working on? And uh, how much do you bring in from outside your, your um, area of concentration? Sorry. I think it's important not to, you know, to close it off too tightly because the, that's sort of not the way things work. You, you want to know where certain, um, in this case, animals or uses of animals came from mm -hmm. and, um, and how, how different uh, life in different environments require different responses. So did you have a sense at that time that you were doing work that was sort of groundbreaking? And I don't mean that in an egotistical sense, but sort of a, you were doing things that hadn't been done and these, there were a lot of new questions you could 
Right, try to ask. but that's true of any sort of original work mm -hmm. that you would um, be involved in. It's, I think, before one starts, it's hard to imagine all of the um, all of the influences that you may be able to um, demonstrate with with um, with the work. I don't think I'm explaining this at all well, but. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think my tendency had been just to do a little, you know, very circumscribed study, but then, um, as I worked further and as I was advised, it, it, um, it wasn't an island, it was influenced by surrounding um, natural um, resources and, and uh, human involvement that brought in from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, yeah. I, I think that makes sense. Uh, Liz, mm -hmm. uh, that material that uh, that you were taking from the tar sands, is that right, uh, on uh, Trinidad? There was some uh, material from the tar sands, mm -hmm. and it was very fortunate that I was somehow taken under the wing of people that worked in um, in the oil company because then oh, I was given permission to um, soak the material in, in fuel, basically, to get the bones out of the tar. Yeah. I mean, those were times that gasoline was expensive, and uh, to use it to clean bones seemed extravagant, but, uh, but yeah, they set me up with buckets of, of uh, material with uh, oil and so on. So did, did you, during that, that field work and then later uh, back, in the, uh, back in the lab, did you uh, realize that you were not only dealing with uh, with nat natural dispersion of animals, but also saw the influences of humans, right, right, the natural, uh, yeah. natural movement of yeah. animals, yeah, yeah, and and in that rich area of northern South America, um, the animal animals and their remains came under the influence of so many different um, um, forces of, of preservation and yeah. dispersion. Yeah, you would have been writing your dissertation just before uh, Island Biogeography would have been written. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so uh, you, you didn't necessarily have, have the advantage of that, mm -hmm. uh, that work. And, and there were a whole string of islands, you know, Isla Margarita and all of those around there and then around Trinidad and, and then on up. Pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I... My understanding is the skeletal collections here were not sufficient for you to do your analysis on the dissertation, so you had to... Collect uh, specific, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because there'd be no collection that would encompass the South American fauna. Yeah. And you, and so you, you worked with, uh, or you 
were lent specimens from Harvard and from uh, institutions in Europe, is that correct? Right, just to fill in until I had built up the collection. You know, Wayne mm -hmm. King was uh, making skeletons there of the, the reptiles. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that comparative collection, it's absolutely vital mm -hmm. to have an adequate one. And uh, that's a whole other enterprise, really, is to, uh, to get, get the specimens, um, particularly, well, and there are also legal restrictions on what you can take, how you can take it, where you can take it, and then <laughs> how you bring it into this, this country. All of that um, have to work around. Mm -hmm. Not work, I don't mean work around, but to... Um, uh, Navigate, kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. To know that you're doing it as it should be done. It's, it, yeah. it, it's easy to look at the end result of uh, archaeology or anthropology and not think about all the back end work that goes yeah, into right. having any chance of making it possible. Right. Yeah. How um, fun it hmm. is. Hmm? You know, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, well, I would hope so, because you did a lot of uh, collection building <laughs> over there. Um, well, so how did you kind of, from what I understand, you sort of ended up kind of creating or helping to create the position that you took at the museum. It didn't really exist prior to you. Oh, no, it wouldn't have existed. Mm. No, but it, uh, I had funding, so, um, so that was good. Mm -hmm. But the the question was how to continue that, and it, it uh, I don't mean to say it just took persuading people to mm -hmm. fund it, but by starting to fund it and then getting people interested in what you're doing, that helps a lot. And there were people working elsewhere. Um, can't think right offhand. Who? Oh. Um, Yikes. We can pause for a moment. Uh, um, we were talking about you creating the position. Oh, oh the position, yeah. sure, sure. And you were talking about uh, people externally that uh, helped in uh, uh, causing, uh, uh, causing the people with the money to, uh, to fund it. Well, the one that comes to mind would be Bill Sears. With oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, Bill. The, the, uh, the are, at that time, there weren't too many zooarchaeologists. Mm -hmm. And if you could satisfy somebody who dearly wanted to have their bones identified, their specimens, then that, that helped a, a lot to, to um, you know, build up a, a satisfied clientele, so to speak. Uh, so if people send, send samples down for, or for wherever, and uh, that it resulted in some useful um, Uh, added added useful information to the uh, uh, understanding of the archaeological site that that helped a lot and yeah uh, Bill Sears there were a number of people that were pleased to have uh, the material done have the material identified because they weren't basically interested in that material. They wanted the information, but they, their primary focus was the pottery or whatever. So to have a, a, a captive zooarchaeologist was, was very good. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then from the zooarchaeologist's point of view, that was great. Yeah. You have more, uh, more evidence of the um, 
demand for that kind of research. Yeah. Um, I imagine. Well, that, I, I mean, that was, that's really a pivotal time. Uh, I mean, let's say broadly the 50s into the 60s in archaeology in terms of, I mean, the, the field changed a lot rather yes, quickly. Yes, I think it time. did, right. Um, it, I mean, did you have that sense of excitement? I know when when Binford and some other people came in, I mean, there was kind of a, right, a thrill right. in the field, yeah, I yeah, guess. Yeah, because yeah. then they demonstrated, you know, the value of the material. Mm -hmm. And then the other jump... Well, I don't know if you call it a jump, but it used, it used to be that people collected archaeological material, sieving it through screens that had, well, quarter inch, but often bigger, half inch or so. Well, amazing amounts of stuff fell through the, those screens. I mean, when I say stuff, of course, there was sand, but there were also archaeological materials and beads and and uh, uh, small bones, you know. And, uh, so when you still see on the TV uh, where they're uh, looking at uh, the excavation of stuff, you still see people scraping away with trowels. But you don't often see where they've taken the material and sieved it through a window screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they sieve it, it's through coarse screen. Well, I understand this. It's easier to work with a bone that's that, that size than with a bone that's that size. They each have distinct, distinguishing characteristics. It's just that one is inconveniently small and the other is, you know, big. But, but the small animals are important or have always been important in the environment, but they're important as a resource that people used and so I've tried to encourage when I realized how much was being lost through the normal screening, uh, it really became clear that people were only getting a small, even though they were taking a lot of pains in getting it, it was just a small portion of what um, was was de a small portion of the deposit, the animal deposit. So um, we've gone through to do studies of the f smaller organisms. Mm -hmm. um, small, though, one animal would provide only a little bit of meat, but often if it's herrings or something that are small but abundant, and you can get them um, all at once, um, that can make a big difference in the economy or the what was used. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's, uh, I mean, that's my understanding of that period, is too, too, is I know there was a practice in archaeology of throwing away a lot of stuff that now is the most valuable stuff. There's, yeah, you get this... Uh, it, it was. It, it seems like a substantial change in perspective, as you were describing. But was it also a challenge? I mean, I get the impression that sometimes archaeologists would sort of, you know, hope to ship out their, you know, the bones that they were interested in, and then just get a list that they could put into an analysis they were already doing. Right. Whereas part of what you did over your career was demonstrate you can actually ask new questions. Right. You, can, you can expand the, the scope of what you're studying based on these materials, that they're not just an appendix. I mean, what, what was that process? Well, like? that was basically um, uh, trying to be 
as complete as possible mm -hmm. in recovery of the material and then in analysis to likewise make sure you know what parts of the skeleton were there. Was there some selection going on? Uh, did did uh, the was there um, selection for uh, the large bones um, that had the most meat on them, for example, uh, and the the finger bones were considered irrelevant, but um, but I think the mo more complete. Um, that's possible, you can uh, analyze what parts of the skeleton were there and whether um, the age of the individuals or uh, the parts that had um, cut marks or burn marks, so you can get a little more information about the uh, use of the animals. and. Um, <laughs> I don't know what she sees. Uh, or hears. Uh, or... And uh, that goes right along with um, the identification of only mammals, for example. Well, mammals are great. We're one. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, other animals were mm. maybe equally or more important. So had reptiles, had fish, had b birds, and invertebrates. They're often quite separate in that they are such uh, taxonomically so different. But for completeness, I think the whole, the whole uh, fauna should be studied. Liz, I, I think that um, also thinking about your particular philosophy uh, on this, one of the things that contributed to our usefulness is that uh, you required us as, uh, as a faunal analysts to write these things up and provide a oh, report. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, otherwise... It's just yeah. a list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And besides, it's much more fun to look at, you know, the different sizes of an animal or ages or, uh, yeah. And that, that's, uh, I gather that's one of the things you really liked about working in the museum is you were able to get people from different fields together absolutely. to talk about these things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And if it was just to, to chat about it, mm. That's that's great too, but to actually then then uh, get people to help uh, provide insight into what is the meaning of the presence of this animal as opposed to that one. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if those same conversations happen today quite as readily, but it may depend on the uh, the composition of the faculty or the mm. composition of the um, you know, faculty in a particular unit if if you have ready access to a specialist on birds one on reptiles that's that's why the museum was the best of all possible worlds because those people were there and usually pretty interested in what other colleagues were doing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, on a, well, it's related in my note, or in my mind anyway, but a kind of related note. I, I read that in 1970, that's when the, the first time you taught Zoark as an actual class, like formally Zoarchaeology as a class, do you remember you much? So. That's that's. <laughs> do you remember much about how you approached teaching it at a time when there wasn't a textbook or any kind of? I think what I did was just approach it the way 
I approached working on faunal samples. Mm. I think so. I, I, I can't really remember specifically mm. thinking about how to do it, but I, I think it's really important to have a good taxonomic background or access to good um, the taxonomic, um, the inclusion of the animals from different taxonomic groups, and then uh, the completeness of the uh, remains, the skeletal completeness, mm -hmm. and the age and size distribution of the, the animals. And then, of course, the association of the different species. So that would be kind of the approach. Uh, I, I mean, I guess it was a very hands-on kind of teaching or... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to teach it without say, see? <laughs> <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> because in abstract, if you haven't worked with animal skeletons, uh, yeah, you don't, uh, you wouldn't necessarily uh, know what to observe, yeah. Was there a lot of interest in that course in the early days, or in? Well, enough so I could keep giving it. All right, that, that works. Yeah. It w seemed to be interest in what was going on in the lab, mm. wouldn't you say? I think so, Liz, and uh, it's interesting to me that, let me see, 70, 70, you taught the first class, 72, you and Antoinette Brown wrote Paleo Nutrition, mm -hmm. which is functionally a, um, a text. A text. Yeah. And then by 70, 76 or somewhere in there, we have Rochelle Merriman and Betsy writes and uh, yeah, the you know. the the uh, colleagues started to accumulate and right. yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think that uh, I think that that laboratory always, uh, both during your tenure and and now, I see see it going on uh, uh, pretty well in the lab now with uh, Kitty. That there's a uh, an extreme interest in what goes on. Mm -hmm. Well, also because of the diversity of what is done, somebody might be interested in birds and not give a hoot about the reptiles, but they'd be there with all of that going around, yeah. around them. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think the uh, philosophy of uh, not providing student spaces or offices and putting them all in the uh, in the laboratory together. Uh, is uh, is most useful and the thing that comes to mind is uh, when I first uh, arrived there uh, you would always or somebody would always put out an item on the, uh, oh, on the yeah. table. <laughs> now what is this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody was interacting yeah yeah that that's that's a useful thing anyway mm -hmm. to have uh, have um, different different projects going on, and then access to what's go, what what those different projects are by the by the student, even though they're not sp specifically working on those, but they get an idea of what's going on. Yeah, I think. Also, um, it's, uh, I'm thinking of Broadcarb and what a wonderful um, research he was doing, even though that was just, well, I don't mean to say just, but it was birds, and so it what, didn't provide the possibility of integrating the bird reach uh, resources with the other vertebrate and invertebrate uh, groups. 
so where I, <coughs> excuse me, I can more or less confine myself to vertebrates, and I should have more aggressively included the invertebrates, you know, the crustaceans and mollusks and so on, but I didn't. Well, but um, I remember in uh, in uh, that book, Paleo Nutrition, with you and Antoinette Brown, uh, at toward the end of the uh, uh, the end of the book, you you were writing about well, what comes next, mm -hmm. and uh, you uh, you indicated in there at that time that uh, um, that the invertebrates were uh, yeah, they were. Sadly Neat, neglected. Yeah. And so then yeah. you end up with Steve Kuba <laughs> and, uh, and some guy by the name of Whitmire that uh, ended up in there as well. <laughs> and that was great. Yeah, that, uh, Hello, that sweetie. started studying those animals. Hello, sweetie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. You know, Liz, that, uh, that, 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 uh, <laughs> that social approach to, uh, uh, to teaching. Uh, brings to mind, and I, I hope mm. I'm not preempting here, not but at all. Um, uh, is that part of uh, what you uh, what uh, what you consider a, a method of teaching interdisciplinary work? Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. functional in the, yeah. the core? Of yeah. Because, uh, Well, in zooarchaeology, if you're considering all animals, that's that's a pretty broad scope. Yeah. Yeah. And those there are limitations in in knowledge of all those species and the uh, detailed anatomy of of any one of them, much less all of them, and along with simply the uh, knowledge of the anatomy, that only gets you to fir first base because you have to also include the, the natural history of that animal. By that I mean the behavior and the, uh, where the ecology of each animal and so on. Yeah, yeah, it does. And whether they were domestic or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so can I ask about a, a logistical aspect of the, you're building up the collections at this time. You don't just go out and get clean bones and put them in a drawer. There's a process of, There's de yeah. definitely a process. And much of that process is a little smelly, mm -hmm. but you learn to breathe through your mouth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, there are other ways of of uh, cleaning bones or shells other than rotting the soft tissue off. Are uh, there? It can be dried, and then you can feed it to the beetles, and mm -hmm. they'll the, both the larvae and the adult will eat the dried flesh off. Uh, there's a hazard to that if you do that in a museum setting, and the beetles get lo loose. Mm -hmm. uh, that can adversely affect the mm -hmm. specimens in the collection. So you have to be extremely careful or do it off-site. Here, we did it off-site. I can't even think exactly where. The behavior lab mm -hmm. is over there somewhere. Um, a car hall roof was the first place, I think. That yeah, that's right. And the smelly thing happened there. And yeah. We were asked to leave. And then <laughs> some of those odors were sucked down into the... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it is unpleasant. I mean, some basically people don't like that smell. Oh, um, no. 
but uh, you can't x-ray the bones you, or, you know, get beyond the flesh. You have to deal with that. And uh, if you're interested in doing the research, that interest will overcome the inconvenience of the smell. So, uh, anyway, what, what am I droning on for? No, because that, that, <laughs> that's what we're here for. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> is it, is it, was there another detail about that? About that? Um, but, I mean, yeah, I guess I was also wondering how you managed finding a site where people could because you can't just go and do that next to classrooms and things necessarily, because oh, yeah, that's a, yeah. a little distracting. You're very right. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, <laughs> Broadcorp managed to do it in his lab pretty much, <laughs> didn't he? He did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I wasn't of that status so that I couldn't do it in the. <laughs> but uh, we were given access to um, a temporary building on campus to do that kind of work. But before that, we did it in the kitchen or someplace, you know. Mm -hmm. Liz, uh, you know, a really good question that I think uh, a lot of folks uh, might have that are not uh, in the museum world would would be uh, why, or can, can you can you deal with just one animal of uh, one taxa for a, a comparative collection, or is there more needed there? Yeah, yeah, sample size is critical, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's individual variation in every animal, mm -hmm. plant, uh, and in order to you have to understand the range of variation in order to identify something accurately. In other words, boy, this looks an awful lot like species X, but it's not quite right. And is it because it's a juvenile as opposed to an adult or an individual variant or uh, what? So therefore, having access to several specimens would help to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And it becomes critical when you have, when you're working with specimens of species uh, that have several subspecies or several related species, and you have to determine the variability within that so that you get the right, uh, you assess it correctly. And that's quite a luxury to have um, several species of, I mean several specimens of deer, for example, because you have young ones, grown ones, and ones from the Panhandle, and ones from Peninsula, Florida. So uh, they all might be variants one way or another. So to have a whole array, and that sounds kind of wasteful or um, uh, over an overstep of of what is really needed, but to truly understand the variation, you need to look at a, a number. No, that that Just, makes sense. We're boring the girl. <laughs> Liz, I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, we've, uh, we've come to a point uh, uh, in, this, in this modern day where we can distribute uh, images and stuff like that. And well, certainly we, we uh, uh, understand the uh, the value of uh, of photographs. Oh yeah. 
but right. uh, but uh, in the modern setting, what of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, actual collections? Yeah, in, in, yeah, that that that's a, a uh, important issue, um, and since I personally was able to work with the actual bones. I think I tend to favor that a great deal. Um, favor the, mm. the uh, possibility of uh, access to, to uh, the full range of variation. I mean, if you look just in this room, there are just, what, four of us, but we're all somewhat different mm -hmm. and the skeletal would re skeletons would reflect those differences and so in making an ad identification you have to be aware of of that and uh hopefully have specimens varied enough that um you can decide whether it's individual variation or that you've missed the boat and you're not identifying it correctly or what have you, a male-female difference, an age, age difference, and all those have an impact. And therefore, um, it's also possible if you have for example, a, a very thorough um, comparative collection of one species that if you can understand the variation in that animal that you may anticipate the same variation in another animal. Um, where that comes in, where that is important I think particularly is in um, domestic animals. If you have a uh, domestic dog, say from the West Coast in Florida, I mean, California and Florida, uh, you might have very different, uh, there might be some large differences through the process of domestication, through um, being in different source source of materials, um, so I think you just have to be very aware of the possibilities of variation mm -hmm. or. Um, not the possibilities that they, there will be variation, mm. but uh, how that variation is manifested in a particular sample. Uh, and so, yeah, being aware of that is important. Well, and so I think a lot of people who haven't done any zooarchaeology might uh, let's say fixate on the visual aspect, being able to see what the bones look like. How, how much is the tactile aspect, like actually holding how, how and much feeling, is what? feeling it, the physical aspect of holding the bones? Is that a big part of the process to you, or? Well, I just happen to like bones, but no. yeah. well, not. <laughs> I mean, in terms of identification, does it help to be able to pick them up and kind of? Well, to pick up an unknown and compare it to mm -hmm. what do you think it might be. You can hold it side by side and rotate it. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I think that's very useful mm -hmm. to... Uh, I, I think Ryan is uh, getting to the point of, um, of wanting to know about the, uh, the actual uh, uh, physical structure of it when you, when you feel it feel it so with mammal bones it might not be uh, you know much of a landmark the feeling of the bone or the, the sight of it but if you get into shells for example oh, yeah. the rugosity of the right. shell that sort of thing 
So. Right, but even with mammals, the older bones would be heavier than the juveniles, or mm -hmm. they might be the same yeah. rough size, but yeah. Have to take, I think you have to re uh, rely on all the aspects mm -hmm. that are available. Uh, all the aspects of variation that are available. Yeah. No, no, makes sense. Well, so, we've been discussing a period where you started taking on students. <coughs> you went from being a student to having students over time. Um, I know this is kind of a, a vague sort of question, but was there a basic philosophy in terms of being a mentor, like how you approached teaching students and helping them to kind of get their careers started? Yes, I think, I think there are several things that are important mm -hmm. in that. Um, you want to provide enough background to the student so that they can, uh, they can each take on a project and um, see it through. Now, uh, I would tend to prefer that a student saw, worked with the whole array of animals in a sample rather than picking out just, just one taxon. But you might want to start with just, just getting a firm ground on deer bone and then add to that uh, other I can't, rabbits or so on, then compare the femur with the femur of, of the two and see how different they are or similar. Oh, they're similar in that you can identify the femur from both of each of them, but they're different in uh, their taxonomic history and uh, how they move in the in the uh, in their their. Uh, world, so to speak, because they're going after different resources, they're different sizes, they have different uh, strategies and, and uh, predators and so on. So they, they will be quite different, even though you can recognize the comparable bone of each of them. And I think it's important to try and understand um, why, why that bone is the way it is and different from this bone, the bone of, say, a deer and a rabbit. Of course, size is an obvious difference, but uh, other features are as well. Um, I'm not sure at all that that's what you've asked me. Well, I, I mean, I think that's part of it, just your approach to mentoring and things like that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I'd always like uh, students to study as complete a sample as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and I personally fall down hard on studying the vertebrates and not including the invertebrates, mm -hmm. which I've always thought I should have done and mm -hmm. never did. Um, so, so I guess one has to, just for convenience, um, mm -hmm. put certain limits and certain emphasis on uh, 
knowing that it's incomplete. Mm. Well, it's unfortunately archaeology can never get a fully complete. Right. Not everything does preserve. Right. Um, a part of the problem is that it takes certain expertise to identify the seeds and mm -hmm. uh, uh, other plant parts and various invertebrates and vertebrates. It's a great array of, of organisms that were used and are still used uh, so that, yeah. Well, yeah. An another thing, if I understand it correctly, so you were involved with also helping to improve the calculations to try to, because I mean, again, you're just getting kinds of pieces of parts of animals, basically, and then you've got to, that doesn't automatically tell you much, so you've got to figure out how many individuals, roughly, are right. we looking at, and then you've also got to think about usable meat versus, right. like, how much does this represent in terms of actual food and protein and that right. what was that process like kind of <laughs> refining that I guess well that certainly does uh, the, the the questions you're you're able to ask and answer with a faunal sample mm -hmm. will determine how much how much insight you can get into the um, human use of that animal. So what I mean by that is, say again, you have a sample with, with deer and rabbit and loads of shell and, um, um, of course, Plants are um, probably there were loads of plants, but you get only a very limited amount of plants. But say you get a lot of acorns too, mm -hmm. so um, uh, you're you have to be conscious of the fact that the rabbits and the deer will give you insight into a certain uh, certain aspects of prehistoric hunting and. Um, uh, use of food, use of muscle for food, but that you have to be aware that you only have a small sliver of what, even though they may be the largest bones in the sample, is still a small sliver of what people used. And uh, you can't just invent what people used. You have to have some evidence for it. Evidence in the way of, of the hard remains that survive or modern techniques have expanded some of these things. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you just have to be aware that what you have is is not a complete as you wish it. Hmm. Well, that's yeah, that that's part of the field overall, I guess. But yeah, mm. um, and also I I know I saw you commented somewhere that. Although your work was well received, sometimes it got, um, not to be sentimental, but a little lonely being the only zooarchaeologist at a whole conference of archaeologists talking about completely other things than faunal <laughs> remains. Um, and you found, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a refuge per se, but there were international conferences you could go to where it was actually all zooarchaeology. And yeah, is, is there anything you could share about those experiences. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah, the uh, archaeology conferences that I've gone to here, and I'm sure it would be the same elsewhere, 
um, the the main source of of information that that those uh, that that research was based on would be um, tools, I mean pottery or stone tools made by people. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas in the zooarchaeology or uh, zooarchaeology groups that I've been with, we all have the same um, uh, types of materials we're working on and know full well that this is just a small small amount of evidence of past uh, uh, uses of resources. Um, it helps, I think, to compare the the archaeological uh, materials from different sites mm-hmm. and you get a pattern building up of of the sort of the uh, the animals that were relied on most widely uh, as opposed to uh, those that that you know were were um, the exceptions to to that. Then you go to some place where there there aren't either deer or rabbit, yet they had animals that were used. What I'm thinking of is some of the Pacific Islands. They had a lot of fish and turtles, totally different, but adequate for sustaining a society, requiring different responses by people, different tools. That's fun, yeah, to (laughs) see that. I can imagine. Well, and that's that's another, at least as as I've learned it, and as it seems, that's another part of uh, a change in archaeology that people point to Binford for. Although I think it was more people than just one or two, but there was a period where archaeology was. Did they describe it as the handmaiden of cultural? You know, cultural could tell you what human variation could be, and then archaeologists would try to find that variation. And it seems like uh, with your generation of archaeologists, archaeologists started trying to help define human variation rather than always looking for an ethnographic example. Right, right. But but it does help to understand how Mm -hmm. um, a tool might have been used and then um, and then get other evidence to support that. What I mean by that is um, if, if you have what would be identified as a spear point, question would be what, what are they spearing each other or some food resource and then uh, f- trying to find uh, an, a food uh, an, a food animal that would <laughs> that you'd use a spear on. I mean, you wouldn't use it on a on a mouse, or uh, you know, it would. You'd have to see what sort of uh, size constraints would be. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Um, was there anything you wanted to jump in with, by the way? Okay. Um, well, so, I mean, I think we're uh, coming up on a good point to close soon. Let's, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, if I could just ask, over the span of your career, how would you say you've seen the field of zooarchaeology change? I mean, what, oh. what do you notice from 
the beginning to now. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> It was a long span. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, it used to be that um, zooarchaeology, just the term, needed full explanation of what was, what was meant by that, whereas mm -hmm. now I think it's pretty, pretty well understood as more people get involved in that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's... I think it, I'm not sure it's, you know, in terms of the population in general, whether uh, people would have any sort of a notion what that was all about. But, but there's been enough uh, natural history programs or television programs where they, uh, where people at least in this country, would understand what, what the general outline of that. Yeah, I, think. I, I guess, Liz, that they don't know, they don't know the, the name zooarchaeology, but they certainly know our work. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I guess this is a pretty good place to close. Um, but do you have any final thoughts or reflections you'd want to? Hmm. Well, I think as people work in this area hmm. and uh, expand to include the different vertebrate and invertebrate groups, and then include the botanical information that will doubtless result in a more complete picture, mm -hmm. if you will, of what was done in the past. Um, I think that's that today a lot more complete uh, uh, understanding is than when I first started, I think. Yeah, it was dear and dear and dear and dear uh, <laughs> early on. Yeah, you, you know, the, the other thing that uh, stands out to me having just come back from a conference is that um, there is such a, uh, a more in-depth uh, a, a quantification approach using quantification. Yes, yes. Well, and uh, chemical studies. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Major step. Yeah. Yep. Have Have you seen Lee Newsom lately, or? Uh, I. Barely passed by her um, uh, at the SEAC uh, meeting. Oh, did you? And uh, I did not get to tag base with her, but mm -hmm. she has moved to St. Augustine. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, that's right. I heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But she she was a wonderful pioneer in the oh, yeah. uh, study of the plant remains. And... Uh, yeah, that was great. Great to have that. Well, yeah. Well, I guess this is a good good place to close the interview, um, unless you had anything else to add at the moment. Well, I'll probably think of a whole bunch of things. <laughs> That's <laughs> how it works. Well, Liz, you'll have a, a third opportunity mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Kitty is going to... Uh, uh, have you f for the third uh, interview that we've got to walk through the collections? With oh, oh! Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll be some time from now. But yeah, uh, the, the, the but you know, so much has been added that I I won't recognize it. Well, that'll be a chance to uh, to ask those questions. Then. <laughs> 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 I think. Uh, 
think uh, I think it'll be uh, uh, an interesting thing for you to see. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, uh, I know when uh, when we uh, when we made the transition, the new curator, uh, that uh, we all had uh, thoughts about how well the collections are being treated and how, uh, and their their status, yes. uh, how they're doing. Right. And uh, and I uh, my hope is is when you look at that, you'll you'll find that. Uh, uh, they are indeed, uh, you know, in, in good hands yes. and in, in a very usable uh, arrangement, arrangement there. Yeah. 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 Good, yeah. But I'll let you be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I fully anticipate that. Yeah. 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 Do you get a, a lot of visitors or regular visitors? Uh, Liz, um, uh, just before I retired, I uh, put together a list of the people that used the laboratory uh, 2015 through uh, fiscal year 2016, and uh, we had uh, we had uh, over just foreign researchers, over uh, over 50 individuals, as I recall. That wow. Came and used collections wow. that represented somewhere in the neighborhood uh, roughly of uh, uh, 1,700 hours of research time in the lab. Oh, that's so, pretty good. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, How does know. that stack up against the other collections in the museum? Well, I don't know. I, I, I should have. I should have. No, oh, but it'd be interesting. It, it would be, but... Uh, I mean, I don't mean it as a comp yeah. uh -huh. competition. Oh, oh, it's all a competition. <laughs> <laughs> but, but friendly and good. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I was just thinking because of the nature of zoo archaeology, you would expect more people coming in because there might be the mammal right. folks or the... Uh, the uh, mollusks folks, you know what I mean. I'll, I'll see if I can uh, d dig that out. Uh, That'd be uh, kind of interesting. Uh, uh, because, you know, a lot of times uh, the other ranges don't uh, uh, don't think and necessarily think in those uh, mm. in those terms, and uh, we do because uh, for various reasons mm -hmm. uh, because it is a it is a measure, and uh, I think. Um, I think that I'd like to ask that question, mm -hmm. and so uh, I'll, I'll go around and tag base with them. But boy, uh, it was uh, it, uh, that year was a busy year. That year being uh, 2015 to oh yeah sure year. Yeah. oh sure yeah. But it seems like uh, in my my estimation, it's been like that uh, now for oh well over ten years. Uh, seeing uh, that 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 amount of growth. And the other thing you'll be, uh, I, I think, happy with this is uh, uh, I continue to see uh, not just the zooarchaeologists or archaeologists using the collections, but uh, we have folks that are uh, 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 fisheries biologists, oh, yeah. um, geologists, we, oh. we have those coming in, paleontologists oh, yeah. uh, looking at uh, uh, at uh, collections, uh, for example, uh, one of John Block's uh, students, uh, um, Via Tech is her last name, was interested in um, the little box turtles and how they've changed oh, yeah. over geological time. Huh. She's a paleontologist, mm -hmm. and so she came in and was very interested in the Fort Center stuff. Oh yes, some of that stuff is almost whole. And, yes, uh, right. So, yeah. so uh, we uh, we're seeing uh, uh, still seeing that uh, that broad range of uh, use of the collection. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I know we're supposed to be at the end of this, but mm -hmm. I have one question. Of course, that I'd of like course. to ask. Um, I and and I had uh, I had a faculty member not long ago come in and uh, looking at the collections and marvelled marveled at it, and he said to me. He says, well, why can't we just have these in the mammal range and the fish over in ichthyology? So uh, in, in your estimation, why a, a zooarchaeology uh, collection, yeah. a, a comparative collection? Yeah. 
because people didn't survive on fish alone. <laughs> uh, you know, they were our um, our diet is very diverse, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore those animals that are in the site, which are presumably largely refuse from past meals, would be equally diverse. And uh, if we were anteaters and studying just our kin, then we would be looking for ant shells, but, but we're not. We're <laughs> different. Uh, so, so it's best having that, that comparative collection all together for I that. I think so, yeah. yeah. I can't imagine how to do it otherwise. You know, to take it apart and then put it back together, yeah, it would be. Anyway, that's just my opinion. But... As a faculty member, I was able to, uh, you know, kind of relay that to them, but I, I don't know how you felt about mm. it. You set them straight. <laughs> oh, as much as I could, Liz. <laughs> <laughs>